On this episode, we talk to Roger Crutchley, 50-year veteran of Bangkok and author of The Long Winding Road to Nakon Nowhere. So if you want to hear some entertaining stories about Bangkok over the decades, you'll love this episode of the Bangkok Podcast. Sawadi crap, you're listening to the Bangkok Podcast. My name is Greg Jorgensen, a Canadian who just got sent a huge box of Canadian snacks. So now I'm full of cheesies and ketchup potato chips. And thanks to Carl, my friend, my diet this week is shot again. <laughs> and I'm Ed Knuth, an American who came to Thailand on a one-year teaching contract 19 years ago, fell in love with eating the leftovers from Greg's care packages, and I never <laughs> left. So you're the son of a bitch that stole my cheesies. Just the leftovers, just the overflow. Do you have uh, dill pickle potato chips and where you're from in America? Uh, I have seen them. I, I cannot say I'm a big fan of them. Whew, man, I miss those, man. Old Dutch dill pickle potato chips. If there's any people out there in Canada that are listening, <laughs> send me a box. I'll be eternally oh. grateful. You get a free shout out. If there's any extra, I'll give them a try. Sweet. All right, before we start, a huge thanks to all of our patrons who support the show. For more info on how you can become a patron, just head to the support page on BangkokPodcast.com. And of course, one of the cool things our patrons get is an unscripted, uncensored bonus episode every week where we talk about current events in Thailand and basically whatever else comes into our minds. So we just finished recording this week's bonus show and we chatted about a Japanese girl who stands her ground uh, when motorbikes try to pass her on a sidewalk and how it's getting a lot of media attention, uh, which turns into a discussion of how much risk Greg and I are willing to take here in Bangkok. Uh, we also talked about an epic overland trip that will travel from Singapore to London and pass through Bangkok. Yeah. Spoiler. Not a lot of risk for me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was cool. All right. Well, on this episode, uh, we sit down with a fellow by the name of Roger Crutchley, who is a very well-known name among long-term residents of Bangkok. Uh, jumping on a crappy old bus in London in 1969 with a one-way ticket for an overland trip to Australia, Roger somehow ended up in Bangkok for a short stay and never really left. Familiar story. Um, he took a job at a little newspaper called the Bangkok Post, where he still writes his weekly postscript column today. Now, Roger's most recent book is called The Long Winding Road to Knack on Nowhere, which I read and really enjoyed. So I thought it would be a good chat about what Bangkok was like back in the day, what Roger thinks of Bangkok today, and talk about some of the stories from his book. So here is my conversation with Mr. Roger Crutchley. Now, Roger, welcome to the Bangkok Podcast. Thanks for coming on. Well, thanks very much for inviting me. Yeah, no, I, I wanted to talk to you because I, I've, I've heard your name uh, here and there for years in Thailand. I've been in Thailand since 2001. And full disclosure, uh, I haven't read a newspaper in a long time. But back in the days when I did, I saw your name all over the place. Now, you were a columnist uh, for the Bangkok Post for a long time, 40 years. Is that right? Yes, that's about right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And I recently read uh, your latest book you put out. I have a copy of it here. It's called uh, The Long Winding Road to Knack on Nowhere. And uh, that's a title that caught my attention because that's, if, if, if listeners, if you're not familiar, that's usually, I mean, in Canada, we say, oh, that guy, he went to shitball Saskatchewan, which means a town in the middle of nowhere. But in Thailand, we say knack on nowhere to, to describe a place that's sort of like isolated and in the middle of, of the boonies. So, uh, I read the book and I thought it was great and I thought it would be really cool to get you on to talk about Bangkok now versus Bangkok then and some of your adventures and your career. And uh, yeah, first off, I, I, really enjoyed the, I really enjoyed the book. Um, why, did you, why did you decide to put all your, all your stuff down on the page? Well, um, i would had a couple of books published before by the Bangkok Post and they were essentially um, highlights from the weekly column. And they, they were good fun to uh, compile and get put together. And I wanted to do a third book, but I thought I'd um, try something a bit different this time. 
And uh, what really what prompted it was so over the years, so many people uh, showed interest when I said that you know I um, I came to Thailand overland from London, uh, which was not the normal way people arrive in right. Thailand. Yeah. And uh, so, and also, they expressed interest in you know what was what was Bangkok like in you know, it was 1969 when I first arrived here. Right. So I thought let's put it down, and um, and I thought and there was enough there, and it got bigger and bigger, and it, it expanded, and I thought well, I might as well make a book out of this. <laughs> nice, nice. Oh, the, it's it's. it's funny because we have similar stories not exactly the same but i came here in 2001 on a vacation with a friend and uh we were supposed to stay for four months and he ended up staying 10 12 days and then he left <laughs> and i was here on my own and i was like well the hell with you i'm gonna stay and see what happens and i'm, I'm probably gonna end up dying here <laughs> so um but one thing that's always struck me is is weird or interesting at least is when people say i came to thailand and I fell in love with the culture. Now, I like Thai culture, and I'm very happy living here, but I've never fell in love with it. I just figured it was an interesting place to be. But what was? why did you decide to sort of stay, stay here? Was it just one month at a time and then one year at a time? Or was there a moment where you said, this is it, Thailand is home? Yes, I, I should explain here that when I left England, I, wasn't, I had no intention of coming to Thailand. Right. That wasn't in my plan, so... Uh, but there I found myself, through certain circumstances, in Calcutta, having to fly to Bangkok. And um, the, because I hadn't been planning to come here, I, d- I didn't have any background. I was, I was totally ignorant about Thailand. I hadn't had any right. background reading. Um, why, why learn about a place you're never going to go to? <laughs> right. And, and also, it, it wasn't like now where you could... Click, click on the internet and do a Google and get the basic facts about a place. We didn't have that sort of stuff in 69. Right, right, right. So, um, so I arrived um, to- totally ignorant and very maybe vulnerable. I didn't know what uh, any- anything about Thai culture. Right. So, uh, but I was very fortunate in... Um, I, I start the first few days I was here... I, I stayed in a little hotel in uh, Chinatown uh-huh. near, near uh, Hula Lumpung railway station. Right. And I got this uh, sort of wonderful vibes from the vendors, and they were all so friendly. And I, I didn't have much money, but I was, every day I was seeing the vendors, and, and they had all these wonderful fruit, and I could, and I could pay... I paid one baht for a huge slice of pineapple and stuff like that. <laughs> one baht, yeah. Ah. And and they were all every everyone, you know. Chinatown's a very busy sort of place, but I got very good um, feedback there. And I thought I felt I felt very comfortable. Right. And this is just after the few da- a couple of days, whereas you know we I just travelled three months through Asia. And not, you know, some of the places you didn't get that feeling at all. So um, that was a good start. Right. So it started off on the right foot yeah. and just went from there. But obviously, just because people smile at you and are very nice doesn't mean that you're really getting into the culture. So you can only learn the, the deeper side of the culture through experience and just if, through your own experiences right and and a lot of it is like trial and error you you uh, a lot a lot of it is error i'm afraid with me <laughs> you, uh, you know you make mistakes and cultural mistakes and things like that and you pick up things what you should do what what you shouldn't do and that, and that's how you you begin to absorb the culture so you just kind of kept on trialing and erroring and yes that's what's really, I really enjoyed reading the book because it was just, you know, cool, personal, interesting, funny stories from back in the day. Just these random experiences that <clears throat> that still happen now in Bangkok, which is part of the reason why I like it so much. Um, but it just goes to show you that, I guess, always been part of Bangkok's charm is these weird, unexpected things that happened. And you think, well, wow, that was strange. 
and memorable and you just kind of wait for the next one. And um, as I was reading the book, I, I, I had it on my Kindle and I highlighted some, some passages throughout. So I might refer back to them while we're talking here. But um, uh, one of them that stood out was, I'm going to read a, a paragraph here. Quote, we had ventured no more than a kilometer to the west of the road out of town when gunshots erupted from the rice fields either side of us. All hell broke loose. Farmers, their wives and children fled from their huts. Soldiers dived for cover, some rather alarmingly sheltering behind our taxi. To say I was scared would be off the mark. Terrified would be far more accurate. Mercifully, after a few minutes, of the shooting died down and we rattled off down the potholed highway towards the relative safety of Sisopan and then off to Batambang. The other passengers, all Cambodian, seemed to take it in their stride. For them, it was just another day, but that's as close as I ever want to get to any war. <laughs> so the area sounded pretty gnarly back then, you know, kind of, kind of like the, the, the Wild West reputation that goes on now. So, Yeah, well, that, that was, I'm talking about Cambodia. Now, right, right, right. So um, we'd, we'd come, they'd only just opened the border between Thailand and Cambodia. At that time, and I was I was with a good friend uh, Tony Waltham, and we we thought let's let's go. Uh, we had to do a sort of visa run. Let, let's go through that the Cambodian border for a change. Yeah, and but then there, were, there was fighting going on in all over Cambodia, and um, it, it it was we were a bit stupid actually, a bit naive going there. And all the, the Cambodians we met on the train, they asked us where we'd come from. We said, Thailand. They said, why are you coming to Cambodia? We said, well, to have a look. And they said, you, you should go back to Thailand. It's much better in Thailand. <laughs> and what year was this? This was the like early 70s? No, 1970s. 1970s. So this was just before the Khmer Rouge stormed in? And... Well, the Khmer Rouge were there. Oh, yeah. Okay, okay. Um, we went to Siem Reap. That's uh, the town where near Angkor Wat. That's mm-hmm. the, but we couldn't get to Angkor because that was in control. The Viet Cong oh, had, were, had control of that. And Siem Reap was surrounded, actually. Uh, but we, somehow we got to Siem Reap. We had a very nervous night there listening to all this gunfire and stuff going on. And you hear all these whiny millennials now complaining about, oh, I had to wait in line for my visa run for longer <laughs> than I expected. You know, <laughs> you were dodging bullets. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's great to look back on it, it's, but at, really, it was a bit silly thing to do. It's pretty crazy. We could easily have got into it. Yeah, it's a folly of youth. You're invincible, right? Yeah, I mean, well, that's how you feel, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And it's funny, yeah, interesting in the book, too, because you mentioned people that long-timers like myself, um, I feel silly calling myself that in your presence because you're a real long-timer. I'm just a newbie. But, you know, Tony Waltham, you mentioned uh, Colin, who publishes The Big Chili now. Like, all these names from back in the 70s, a lot of them are still here. Yes. So why why did a lot of you decide to stick around? Was it something particular in the water or with your characters or, or what? No, it's hard to say, but there are, there are, as you say, an awful lot of people who came out at roughly the time that I did or shortly afterwards, and, and they are still here. Yeah, and as you mentioned, Colin, he, he uh, Colin Hastings, he um, he did the same overland trip as me, roughly oh, about, about five years later. Oh, right. So, uh, and and quite a few uh, of the people that I know uh, in Bangkok still, and they, they quite a few of them did that trip, but of course you you couldn't can't do it now. With, ever since that Afghanistan became a trouble spot right you, it's impossible to do the overland trip right you've got some great stories in there about your the, the the crappy bus you had breaking down in afghanistan and in the middle of the road middle of middle of the night and rainstorms and stuff like this it's interesting to read i flew here on a nice safe airplane so another paragraph from the book that caught my eye was was this one you said there was only a smattering of go-go bars with pole dancers on pat pong at that time but this was to change significantly in the mid-1970s, Pat Pong really began to pick up steam, and in 1975 also marked the beginning of the end of the new Petbury Road bars. So, Petbury Road now, I gotta say, Petbury Road is my top 
hated road in Bangkok. <laughs> like I think this is, I hate it. I hate driving down it. I hate crossing it. I hate walking near it because it's dusty and gross and abandoned. But it seems like back in the day, that was the, that was the center of the nightlife. Yeah. Uh, I was going to say, you would have loved it in the 1970s. <laughs> it, it was an extraordinary place. Um, I have to point out, you know, I'd come from a small town in England and from where the nightlife was going to the pub, local pub, right. with, my, with my mates. And yeah. even, even when I was living in London, it was more or less nightlife was visit the pub. Right. And then I fa- found myself there on Pepperie Road and so all these bars down there full of drunken U.S. servicemen. Uh, they're all uh, on R&R from Vietnam. Yeah. And they, were, they used to get, I think, seven days leave. And they were all determined to use up every minute of that seven days as celebrating, drinking. And doing what, doing and what, doing what young the, drunk men yes, get up yes. to in Bangkok. And... I, I found it quite exciting. All, you know, all, all the bars were much the same. They had the same sort of format. Uh, there was a band, live band, rock and roll band, yeah. a Thai band, a dance floor, and and girls, and lots of girls. Uh-huh. And some of the bands were, uh, they, they all played rock, uh, they just cover versions of all the rock music they knew, which was at that time was Beatles, Jimi Hendrix. The good uh, stuff. Oh, the good stuff, yeah. The Credence Clearwater Revival were very popular out here at right. that time. And, um, and the bands were good, but everyone it was, was having a good time. And um, it's a very sort of spontaneous uh, feeling uh, in, in, the, in the bars there. Much, much more exciting than I've these days to me than really than, yeah much more exciting than these days yeah but it sounds the same i mean you got a, you got music you've got girls you've got drunken idiots is it was it just the well you know, same same but different I, it might have been it's partly because i was only in my early 20s at that time so that <laughs> yeah. that would have made a difference yeah but no, there was a real buzz because you know i'd read about the vietnam war on that in, in when, when i was living in england but i hadn't taken too much notice of it and then suddenly I found myself talking guys, helicopter pilots and whatnot, who said, oh, telling me stories about how they strafed the village and this sort of stuff. Yeah. And I, and I thought, well, you know, this is the, this is the real thing. <laughs> yeah. And, but it wasn't just that. It was it was the mu- the live music made a big difference, and uh, of course there, there were all problems too, the fights and. The, well, it seems also that it's a, it was a, almost a different, I mean, obviously it's a different time, but it was a different world. I mean, now everyone who comes to Thailand has read, researched, seen photos, read the do's, read the don'ts. But back then, I think a lot of people like yourself were showing up here and it was, everything was totally new and it was unprecedented and you weren't familiar with it. So I think like, I imagine anyway, that everyone here was seeing everything for the first time, yes. which sort of creates a sort of everyone is on the same page exploring at the same time whereas now a lot of people have already seen and read about the stuff they're doing so it's a bit it, bit less exciting i think yeah it's almost like there's too much information right available you know you can people know exactly which restaurants to go and where you know the, yeah. all these things whereas you know, when i was first here we, we didn't have any background information about anything you, you just you just went out there and yeah you, you weren't sta- you weren't standing outside of a restaurant looking at TripAdvisor. Uh, no, no <laughs> exactly yeah <laughs> and um something that that also is not really related to our the, the the conversation we're having now although it was in the book but one of one of my favorite uh dishes here is uh i can't remember how to say it properly bad pong pu curry which is crab meat stir-fried and curry yeah, powder yeah and one of the quotes from your book is one of the more bizarre offerings spotted on menus around the kingdom is crab cooks whore dust apparently in the old days curry was thai slang for prostitute so the dish is in fact crab with curry powder i just i just thought that was funny and i want to mention it but i've never heard a prostitute called a Called a curry. Curry. No, well, I suppose every country has its own sort of slang, <laughs> and um, certainly that was. I was um, 
Thai uh, journalists confirmed to me that that's accurate. That's the uh, that's what Curry. The, yeah, <laughs> and yeah, and of course the the, um, the Thai menus have always been fun. Yeah. Right, right. You get traveling in the provinces, which I'm sure you've 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 seen, you get some very entertaining English dis- descriptions. Right, crab meat yeah, instead yes, of crab yeah. and things like that. Yeah. yeah. So let's let's talk a little bit about the post. I mean, you you were a, a newspaperman for forty years. Yes, you must have seen some incredible changes um, in the in the in the in the industry. And though, of course, the most recent big news in Thailand here is that one of the two main English newspapers, in the Nation, will be going internet only, digital only. They're yes. going to stop printing their print edition. So, but you're still writing for the Bangkok Post. Yes, I'm, I'm still doing the column. I I don't know for how much longer, but. Uh, <laughs> uh, I mean, it, it's, it's not a good time for newspapers it? Right. around the world. It's, it's um, c- because the competition uh, of all the new technology, and it's obviously it's they're struggling. But I, th- I think a lot of newspapers can keep going through the on, online. I hope the post the post is still a printed version, and I hope they keep it going because I still prefer. Have them paper in my hands rather yeah. than uh, reading it off the internet. There is something special about the smell of of, of printing ink. Yeah. Every time I open a fresh newspaper, I'm immediately back, twelve years old on my paper route. You know. I mean, when I first hear it, right, there, were, there was no computers or anything. So, you, know, you you typed stories on the typewriter, and, uh, and, right. and, and that, and there was everything was was copy. There was. Um, there's nothing. There wasn't anything electronic involved. Yeah, yeah. You tell some interesting stories in the book about the early days at the Post and how all these poor reporters would get together and go out for beers after, and you would run down to the like some riot or some standoff somewhere and wait outside. It was very, uh, very real and old school and cool, sort of almost romantic back in the day. You know. Yeah. The, uh, I mean, the post, when I was first there, it's almost like a family business, that's what it felt like, because we were all jammed in on the same floor type of thing. Yeah. And so if there were any arguments or any... Everybody knew about it. So, <laughs> And it was a wonderful mixture of, of, of people, collection, you know, people from all over the world all working there doing doing their bit yeah and, uh, it was a wonderful experience for me because uh, so after a while I, I mean I come from England where where you at that time there weren't that many uh, foreign people there and so foreigners stood out but at the post I, I was working with Indians Filipinos uh, Indonesians in, uh, Pakistanis, all, all, all sorts, and a lot of times, of course. But you, after a while, you, you never, you didn't think of them as an, any particular. They were just post people, right? right? Yeah, yeah. So looking back over the decades, then, like, what role has the post played in in Bangkok growing up into the modern city it is today? I mean, it played a very important role in the early days because uh, Thai TV. In the 70s, let's say, was pretty poor in, the, in those days. And, based, and there was no satellite or anything. So people actually depended on the uh, Bangkok Post f- for the news, to get their news. And so every morning, it was widely read by I mean, every diplomat. It didn't have a huge circulation, but it was read by everyone that mattered because they, right. they wanted to find out what was going on right. in uh Bangkok and Thailand. I feel the same way about the podcast, although it's probably <laughs> less <laughs> oh, less yes. earned than the post. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, so you did feel responsible when, uh, when you were putting out the, the paper. It was, uh, you, you know, you, you were providing a, a service, you know, and people dip, uh, relied on it being accurate. Right. And I think a lot of, a lot of younger people, too, won't, re- won't know the the stomach churning dread of realizing that something you've printed and put out is wrong, or even if something as simple as a spelling mistake. Now you write it on a website and you're, oh, made a mistake. I'll just go back and log into WordPress and fix that. 
But I mean, back in the day, your information had to be rock solid or as rock solid as it could be. Imagine putting out a story that went out to thousands and thousands of people permanently and something was wrong. Like that's a level of responsibility that I think people don't really enjoy anymore. <laughs> No, that, that's true. I, I started at the Post as a proofreader, mm-hmm. as did most of, of my colleagues. And in, you, were, you were given a page, a printed page, and you had to read everything there. And there should not be a single mistake on that page. You know, yeah, you're no talking pressure. about thousands and thousands of words. <laughs> and, you, and the next day, when, after the paper printed... You would sort of, uh, I'd, I'd go in the office and sort of hope there's nothing <laughs> yeah. wrong with my page. Because if there was, there would be someone who'd be standing there and said, Who read this page? <laughs> oh, no. Yeah. So, um, um, well, we all, we all passed the blame on the, everybody blamed the proofreaders because they were the bottom of the palm. But, right. But in fact, quite often it was the sub editor's mistake or it. Perhaps with the reporters, the original who wrote the original story, but uh, I mean, it, it was it's all part of the, the job. That's what you you did, you know. Right, right. Um, I want to talk more about what you think of Bangkok back in the seventies versus Bangkok now. Um, do you do you still like the city? Like, is it, uh, is, it is it easier to live in? Is it is it harder to live in? Is it is it a better city than it was? Yeah, this is I, I get asked this quite a bit. Oh, I, I thought I was being original. <laughs> and, uh, unfortunately, <laughs> I still can't answer it. It's, I mean, it's, there's so many contradictions. And, of course, I look back on the Bangkok when I arrived in a kind of romantic burst, romanticised version because I was young, everything was new. Right. And everything was a, a great new experience. Uh, and of course, now a bit jaundiced, and then, but um, I mean, there's, there's been so obviously some huge physically like huge changes. When I arrived, there, there weren't any high-rise buildings, uh, right? The, and they were building the Dusitani Hotel, uh, and that um, that was finished, completed in 1970, and that was 23 stories. And that was the tallest building in Bangkok. And you could see it for miles around. Really? Miles and miles. As you were approaching on the road coming into Bangkok, you could see the, always see the Dusit Tan. Wow. 23 it, stories. 23 stories, yeah. Wow. And unfortunately, I think it's, it's being knocked down now. Right? It's uh, having yeah, to make way. That's on the corner of Silom and Rama 4. Yeah. So you can say you've been in Bangkok for like 1.4 Dusitanis yeah. <laughs> or something like that. And there was um, the next big building was a place called Chok Chai Tower on Sukhumbu, about, about where Soy 24 is. And it was, that was a 28 story, but it's just an ordinary skyscraper, you know, straight up and down okay. block. Nothing but, beautiful like but, the Dusitani. No, the Dusitani was well, a very, very nice looking building, I think. But th- this was just a block. But I, st- I went up to the top to get the panorama view of the. You can see right across the Tombury, and uh, it's a wonderful view. Mm. But uh, of course, now you, you look at the, the panorama in Bangkok now, it's, it's just, it could be any city in, in the world, frankly. Mm, right. And of course, in those days, the only department store, there was a uh, central had a couple of small departments. Oh, stores. even back then, hey? Yeah. But there, was, uh, there were no malls or, or anything like that. And now, of course, we're over, overwhelmed by, by malls. And, but uh, in the old days, uh, I used to wonder why the cinemas were always packed out. And uh, after a while, it dawned on me, it wasn't because of the movies, but people, it was the only place you got air conditioning in the moment. <laughs> and people were just, didn't matter what the film was, you, you just uh, pay 10 baht and have a couple of hours cooling down. Oh, yeah. Whereas now I think the malls have taken over that role because yeah. I'm sure, although thousands of people you see in the malls every day, but I'm sure a lot of them don't actually buy anything now. Yeah, well, I mean, during April when it's real hot, like, well, let's go to the mall. I'll, let's use yeah. their air con instead of me paying for it. Right, right. I'll go and sit in a bookstore for two hours. 
So um, yeah, those are, those are like phys- obviously physical changes. I mean, the worst thing with about, I, I, would, I don't like talking about the traffic. Yeah. In fact, I I banned myself from writing about traffic oh, yeah. in, in the postscript column. Uh, but uh, you have to say it. The, the traffic is it's, it's appalling, and um, but it's always been bad. Even in the day, early days, I recall being stuck in jams. You know, back in the seventies. Really? Yeah. And in those days, it's worse if you because the the uh, taxis didn't have any air conditioning. So you, if you got stuck in a jam at a, in the heat of April and you well, were in a taxi, you really knew it. I think I've mentioned this on the podcast before, but one of my worst memories in Bangkok is riding a non-air-conditioned bus at rush hour uh, oh, for some yes. mad reason. Yep. And I was stuck on the seat with my girlfriend at the time in the back, so like squished in like sardines with other Thai people. And everyone was quiet and silent. And it was just the windows were open and we were stuck in traffic. And in my head was just screaming, get out, move, go. But sweat was dripping down my back, and it was so awful. <laughs> I hated it. And that was how everyone did it back in the day. Right. right. Yeah. So, I mean, that, that's it's just terrible planning, really. Uh, in the old days, there weren't enough roads, and, but they've done it bit by bit, the old flyover here and bridge there. What about flooding? Was there flooding? Flooding, there? yes. I, I experienced quite... Quite a lot flooding. I, right. I actually waded to work one day in the 1983, I think it was, oh, yeah. from Sukhumvit Soy 49, and which was totally underwater, all the way to the Bangkok Post, which was at the Uchulian building opposite Lumpini Park at that time. So it took me two and a half hours. You walked in water the whole I, way? I walked in water the whole way. <laughs> oh, my <yeah>. God. <laughs> uh, and, it, and it's... Sukhumvit, I've never seen anything like it. Absolute scenes of chaos. You know. Wow. But, um, and there have been quite, quite a few. The flooding now is not as bad as it used to be. So, really? Yeah. But you, as you will have seen in recent years, the, the, the people get really upset when their, their areas get flooded. It's right. Understandably. Yeah, but then you guys, uh, you guys have been here a long time, can sit back and say, you guys don't know how good you have it. Yeah, that's a, I mean, I'm, I'm one of these old guys who I can say that for everything. Oh, you know, <laughs> what? You're complaining. I can remember when things were like right. this. this, yeah, and this. In Canada, yeah. the joke is so, when I was a kid, we walked in bare feet in snow, but you can say, we waited to work in Bangkok. Yeah. But that's right. So I do tend, you know, you can you can become a bit of a bore when you when someone says, "Oh, I've just been in this terrible traffic jam or something," and say, "Well, I've been done much worse one than that." Did you have air conditioning? <laughs> yeah. Well, then <laughs> well, shut <yeah>. up. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. That's, that's, yeah. uh, so so what about Pat Pong? Like, I, I, as far as I know, back in the day, Pat Pong was a pineapple plantation, and then like in the forties, it started to become a place where people would go to dine and drink but what was your memories like of it back then yeah well Pat Pong when I arrived it was already a, a night life area but it was uh, fairly subdued and it, it was primarily cocktail lounges okay. and, and restaurants and so very and during the day it was just a regular street and there were businesses there too but um at night, it really opened up, and around about the time I arrived, the, they started uh, introducing go-go dancing okay. to the bars, and that really livened the street up. And um, there were several sort of very lively places to go to. Um, or one of my favourites was the uh, Mississippi Queen. Mississippi Queen. Yeah. All right, nice. And they play good soul music. Classy. And... It became, uh, Mississippi Queen became well known because it was featured in that, The Deer Hunter. Oh, the yeah, Hunter, right. Big, the Christopher Walken movie. Yeah. yeah. And one of the dancers in Papong was had a scene in that, and they shot it in uh, Mississippi Queen. Oh, wow. And Noi was her name, and she was, she, I think she danced at another bar, but and it was supposed to be Saigon. Right, and she, the star picks 
picks her up, starts chatting to her in the bar. That's that's the scene. Okay. She won a lot of brownie points by uh, appearing in this. Yeah, I bet. What, what was a very good movie. That's a, that's that's genuine street cred. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, she was the. Uh, yeah. And that same year, the I think the um, Rotary Club arranged a Pat Pong Mardi Gras. Oh God! And <laughs> oh I, man, that sounds and, like a recipe for disaster. Well. And he closed off both ends of the road. It's wonderful. And I, I was invited to be a judge in the beauty contest for oh. Miss Platform. So I had a wonderful time so, <laughs> uh, sitting there with beers coming and um, watching all these lovely ladies. Yeah. Uh, and in, in the contest was Noi, who was in the movie. She was also one of the contestants. And it came as no surprise that she won. Because <laughs> I think there would have been a riot if she didn't. <laughs> right. I can imagine, yeah. The deer hunter girl. Yes. Occasionally, just to get away from all the Pat Pong mayhem and madness, I I'd, 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 I'd occasionally go to um, sort of a cocktail lounge or, or a quieter place, you know, yeah. just to chill out a bit. And Unwind and relax. Occasionally, I've, I've written about nightlife in the column. And about two months ago, I got an email from a lady, a Thai lady living in the States from Alabama. Oh, yeah. And she signed herself off as Sweet Home Alabama. <laughs> and she said in her email, you've written about that, uh, that period. Do, do you remember this uh, a particular... Um, cocktail lounge called the Garden Cafe, and I wrote back, "Yes, I did because I, I I went there quite a few times." And she said, "If you remember a Thai young Thai lady dancing on the piano, that was probably me." Oh wow! And there she is. She's writing this from Alabama, and she must be about seventy years old herself <laughs> now, right? Because she's talking about nineteen seventy. Wow! Right? And she was. Uh, and I thought that was very nice that I get this sort of feedback from uh, this lady in in, that's so in Alabama about that's... the the nights she used to dance on the piano. Do you remember me dancing on the piano thirty <laughs> years ago? Yeah, that's that's forty <laughs> years ago. That's that's crazy. What a flash! What a blast from the past. So we uh, we've said on the on the show before that Bangkok is actually a very safe city, one of the safest cities in the world, I think, as far as being a foreigner, anyway. But but you've lived through some pretty harrowing times, some pretty uh, sort of iconic forks in the road for Thailand, like the October Revolution and things like that. What was what was that like? Yes, the um, uh, generally speaking, I, I, I feel quite safe in Thailand. But uh, there was one period, and that was the October Fourteenth uh, uprising by the students. And I, actually, I, I went down there, and the, it's one of the first stories I reported for the uh, <laughs> Bangkok Post. But but it was after that, because uh, they they kicked out the prime minister, but one of the targets in these up, uprising were the police, and they burnt down the police headquarters. Oh, wow. So uh, for the next few weeks... That there were no police at all on the street. Oh, jeez. No, nothing. So there was no, no one keeping law and order as such. Wow. And that's when the one time in Bangkok that I felt it, it was not a good idea to go out late at night. Really? And um, I was, had an example of this. I, I was, at that time, I was um, living on Sukhumvit Soy 8 in, in a little house sharing with a, a, f- a friend called Dick Wood, a, a New Zealand friend. And we were sitting having a chat. This was about two days after October 14th. We were just having a chat, and the, then we heard this scream and uh, the shout, Kamoi, Kamoi. Uh, uh, thief. Thief, thief. Right. thief. And looked out, and uh, there was a, it was about 10 or 11 at night, and I saw these two guys running down the road past past our house, who were presumably the robbers. Uh-huh. And I, I sort of said, well, I'm not getting involved in this. <laughs> but old Dick, he was a totally different sort of personality. Oh, right. he, he was only wearing a pacama. And he, chased, he, he ran out of the door, through the garden, out into the street, 
and chased these guys down the Jeez. soy. And I, and I followed him, but at a, quite a distance. <laughs> and then I heard there were two gunshots. I thought, oh no, Dick's you know, they're shooting at Dick. And I went out into the soy and looked out. And much to my relief, I saw Dick running back towards me. And it, his, his pack of my eye almost fallen off. He was like almost indecent. <laughs> but he was laughing, saying, oh, when they start shooting at me, I thought I'd better turn around. <laughs> yeah, no <laughs> kidding. <laughs> so that was one example. And, you know, there was total on the streets. You had to be very careful at that time. But all credit to the students and that at that time. They, they organised things and they organised kind of, I think, little night watch groups and things just to, right. to you know, look after people. I wonder why you don't see that same level of engagement, political engagement, by students these days. No, this uh, it's been very quiet in that area. They, they, uh, not, nothing. I, and mind you, there'd been nothing like it before when the October Fourteenth was. They, they came, came out of the blue, really. Right, right. They, I think they had some quite strong leaders in the students. And, yeah. You know, and all the, those people are now all um, middle aged. Uh, and senior people. And yeah, bankers and yeah, yeah, businessmen and what have you. Well, where where could I mean this book I mentioned is called uh, the Long Winding Road to Nakon Nowhere. I bought it on Amazon on my Kindle, but you can yeah. buy physical. Where can people buy the? Book? It, it should be available in Asia Books. Uh, I I think we've just sent a new batch to okay. Asia Books, but uh, if not, as you say, it's on, it's available on Amazon. Yeah, and. Uh, we're trying to get it to sort of spread it around to as many bookshops as, as possible. Yeah, yeah. Anyone, anyone interested in uh, in Bangkok that was Bangkok back in the old days, you should pick it up. It's a fun, easy read, and it's a good look back into into a city in its infancy. Well, not infancy, but for from my perspective, anyway, it was a long time ago. So, and they can still read you in the Bangkok Post. Yes, every every Sunday, I'm still there with. The, uh, no, mugshot is the the dog, right? The dog with the it's called with the, the long ears. Yeah, the beagle or something. The, well, yeah, I'm not sure what it was, but I think it suits it suits the column quite well. <laughs> it, it's better than having my mugshot there, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> and and one one more anecdote that I heard. I want you to. I want to see if it's true. I heard from my old uh, an, an old friend of mine. He said that back in the day, back in the like, like late seventies and early eighties, probably. Um, there was a lot of Farang journalists here and they would go and cover events or press conferences or what have you having to do with or at the palace. But they would always show up dressed sh- so shabbily because no one had any money. So there was one tailor shop that everyone was sort of directed to, like that offered special prices for journalists or something like this because all the journalists looked so crappy that they wanted them to at least be able it's to present themselves enough. professionally. <laughs> Well, do you have well, any memories of well, that? Well, I certainly wasn't one of the journalists. Uh, I never <laughs> went to the palace. Oh, OK. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I can imagine, because the journalists are a pretty shabby lot when it comes <laughs> to dress sense or anything like that. Right. Uh, I, could, I could understand that how that would happen, because um, <laughs> they certainly do need smartening up sometimes. That was a different time. <laughs> Well, Roger, thanks, thanks so much for, for coming, on, uh, coming on the show. It was a pleasure to talk to you and really cool looking back into uh, Bangkok from, from the old days. It's a fascinating city and, and it appears it always has been, and probably always will be. So, yeah, thanks for looking back. Check out the book, everyone, um, uh, The Long Winding Road to Nakon Nowhere. It's a really fun read and you can check out Roger's column in the post every, every Sunday, right? Yes, every, every Sunday. Sunday. Cool. Thank you for coming on, sir, and I look forward to your next book. Yeah. Thank you very much. You know, guys like that, uh, they really put us to shame because uh, we feel like we've been here a long time. And then, of course, there's dudes like Roger Crutchley who have been here more than twice as long as we have. Like, they, we need another word for them. Like, he's not an expat. He's... He's like a super pat or a super expat. Super expat. He's got like the next the next level of rank above us. 
he does. He's, you know? he's, I think he's at the highest level. You know, I, I think, I think above black belt is red belt. It's like some like master level. I, I think once you crack 50 years, then you're, you're a red belt. I think we need to classify it. I think there's got to be like expat, super expat, and then like ultra expat. Ultra pat. <laughs> Jedi expat or something like that. <laughs> well, 50 years. I mean, that's, that, that's up there. I don't think there could be, that's got to be the highest level. I don't care. Yeah. I think 50 and above probably there's, there's, you're not going to be here much, much, much longer than less, much longer yeah. than that. Unless you came here when you were like a wee, a wee yeah. baby. That's Yoda. That's the Yoda level. Right. But it was really cool. He was, he was a very nice guy and very relaxed and, and chill. And we just sat down and chatted and, um, you know, uh, it's, you know, it got me thinking a lot when I was, especially for me, and I, I don't know if anyone is, is like this or it was just me, but when I was younger, you know, my teenager and stuff, I, I never really listened to to people with a lot of experience doing something, my grandparents or older people that, that had been there and done that and, and, and could give me good advice. And I always sort of like poo-pooed them like, ah, pff, you, what do you know? Like, I'm young and hip and cool, blah, blah, blah. You know, but <laughs> as you get older, you realize that there is real value in listening very carefully to people with a lot of experience like Roger has. And um, for some someone like us who are trying to figure out Bangkok and who live in the middle of this chaotic city, you know, hearing these stories about what it was like 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago, uh, it's really, really interesting. And we can learn a lot about it, about how it's changed and about where for it's sure. going. So, yeah, yeah I, mean, really, I love really hearing cool to sit down with them. I love hearing stories about Bangkok in the 70s, 80s, even 90s. You know, it, it, I, think, I think in the 90s, Bangkok changed a lot. So by the time we got here, you know, there was already a SkyTrain, you know. But people who were here in the 80s, it's to- it was totally different. You know, pictures from the 80s, you know, Tong Lor is basically like a country road. You yeah, know, in, yeah. The, in the 80s. Uh, so, you know, so basically expats who are around the 30 year mark like 30 to 35 years they they really saw a different bangkok really different right i think i think every 5 years like people who live here go like oh you should have seen it 5 years ago it was way different yeah. blah 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 yeah, yeah. you know roger's gone through that transition 10 times you know? yeah well it's funny i mean I, I obviously i can i i can give examples of how bangkok has changed since i've been here um but to be honest, it, it hasn't been absolutely stark, you know, because by the th- when I got here, there was already a, a, a BTS, although obviously it's been extended a lot. Yeah. Uh, the MRT w- had not opened, so that was a big deal when the MRT opened. And I've seen, like, a lot of restaurants come and go, a lot of shops come and go. I've seen parts of the city kind of build up and get nicer. But I, I don't know, man. What do you think? I mean, I, I think in our period of time, in our 20 years, I don't think it's a stark difference like a black and white it's been more like slow growth and slow change yeah i mean what do you think i agree 100 percent. i want to see like people say what was it like 20 years ago and i'm like well i mean there wasn't as many tall buildings yeah i mean yeah it's like i can't say you wouldn't believe what it was like in 2005 i can't really say that because right i mean it, it was different and i can give specific examples but it wasn't a different city right but where like where roger talked about on his in his stories you know like have have you ever been to Paris? I have not. Okay. Well, one one of the coolest things about coming into Paris is you can see the Eiffel Tower from like kilometers out of the city. And as someone who's you know who's read about the Eiffel Tower in Paris and his, history books his whole life, and then to see it you know on the horizon is pretty cool. You know, and then Roger told the story about how he had the same experience coming to Bangkok, except it was the Dusatani Hotel back in the seventies, right, right, right. eighties. You know, like the Dusatani Hotel, which is now being torn down. You know, like that's a lot of change to see in your lifetime. For sure, I, I think I think from from the seventies to the nineties, I think Bangkok completely transformed. Yeah, uh, yeah. I'm just happy the taxis have air conditioning now because they didn't <laughs> when you first got here. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I I, I can agree with that. Yeah, for sure. Well, th- thanks, Roger. It was really cool meeting you, and uh, I I really did enjoy uh, enjoy his book. Um, it was it's just a fun, easy read, and it talks about the people he met, some of which are still here. Uh, and the adventures he's had, the misadventures he's had, and the funny people he's sort of worked with over the years. So check it out. It's like 300 baht on Amazon and um, the long winding road to Nakon Nowhere. It's a good read and it's it's a good look back at the Bangkok of the past. So check that out. And thanks again, Roger.
All right, well, let's get into some Love, Loathe, or Live With, where one of us surprises the other with a particular aspect of life in Bangkok, which we discuss and decide if it's something we love about living here, loathe about living here, or have come to accept it as just part of the crazy tapestry of Bangkok, no matter what we think. So this week, Ed, it's over to you. Okay, uh, so I feel like this possibly could be something uh, you've heard before, but I'll give it a whirl anyway, because I think this is a, a classic... Uh, Bangkok slash Thailand experience. So, All right. p- picture this, Greg. You're you're in the line at the ATM. Yep. You got two or three people in front of you, and so you know one person does their thing and leaves, and the person in front of you goes and puts their card in, and they're doing their thing, and you know you're waiting patiently, and uh, you know they pop their card out, and you're kind of getting ready to get your card out, and then they take another card out and put it in, <laughs> and continue and continue doing something else, like they're transferring money. Like they're transferring money and then they take that card out and put another card in (laughs) and it just keeps going and going and going. That's funny. I have never had three cards, but I've definitely had two cards. And it's interesting (laughs) that now that I think about it, yeah, it seems that a lot of Thai people do spend a lot of time at the ATM sometimes. And you're standing behind them, and you're like, "Are are you like remortgaging your house? What's what's going on up there?" Like, I mean, they, they they tend to do. I I I I mean, eventually, I kind of figured out what was going on. I, I realized that a lot of Thai people um, pay bills at the ATM, or they transfer yeah. money, and yeah. and they're and they're not in general. They're not shy about doing multiple transactions or using multiple cards. Now, occasionally, to give credit where credit is due, occasionally, I've seen someone look back and realize like I'm waiting or there's a line and then they'll they'll pop a card out and then they'll get back in line which is really what you should do after you've been there for a couple transactions like you know like you know but to be honest uh I think most people most Thai people if they have got five things to do they just stand up there and do all five that's interesting yeah yeah I, I pride myself on how fast I am and I sort of like sometimes I like look around See if anyone's watching. Like, check this out. You know, and I'm like, I'm like, beep, 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 and I'm done. And then I have to wait for the money to come out. Like, I, I, I generally only use the ATMs to withdraw cash, and it takes me about 15 seconds. You know, that's very. Yeah, I don't polite. Know if you remember that old episode of Seinfeld where he walked up to a ATM and there was a woman standing at the ATM next to him, and he's like, "Passcode, withdraw, no, no, yes, thank you." And he got his money, and he looked over to her, and he goes, "I win." And then, like, he ended up asking her out, you know. <laughs> but that that's how I feel. Like, like watch me. I'm so fast and efficient at this thing. Whereas the person beside me is, like, pulling out their second card and, like, reading the instructions very carefully on the screen. But maybe well, they're doing something that needs needs a lot of attention. I don't know. But, well, yeah. Is it, a, is it a love, loathe, or live with? You know, it's a live with. Because uh, I I am so lucky to be able to not walk into a bank. Like, Anything that allows me to not deal with Thai banks in person <laughs> is a huge that's true. win. You know? That's true. So that, I would much point. rather wait for 10 minutes behind someone. Well, maybe not 10 minutes, but, you know, I would much rather wait behind someone at an ATM than go into a Thai bank. So I'm already winning. So definitely it's not something I love, but I will live with it happily. Well, I, I mean, this may not surprise you since it was my idea, but I'm going to go loathe on this. And the reason mm. I, 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 your your point is understandable, and I do sometimes feel that way. But the reason I'm going to go with loathe is the unpredictability of it. I always feel <laughs> that I always feel that the person in front of me, I'm, you know, they're finishing up. So I'm like, I got my card out, you know. So I'm, it's the expectation that I'm about to go, but then they take out another card. You know, it's right, the right. it's the you know what it reminds me of a little bit? It reminds me of uh, the shows again. This shows my age, but I don't know if you remember. I believe it was in Ferris Bueller's Day Off Classic. when uh, I think he's waiting. I mean, you're, since you're a movie guy, you will be able to correct me if I have the wrong movie. But I think he's. It's at the end of the school day, and he's looking at the clock. Like you know, it's like he gets out at three p.m. and and the clock, the minute hand. You know, it's at like you know two fifty seven, and it clicks to like two fifty eight. And then it clicks to 259. <laughs> yeah. And then he's waiting and it clicks backwards to 258. <laughs> That's funny. And it's, and it's torture. That's how I feel. I feel I feel like I'm about to be able to use my card. And then they take out another card and it's like time is, time is going backwards. <laughs> it's like I'm back where I started. Yes. 
For yes. the record, I don't think that was Ferris Bueller because the point of the movie was that he never was in school that day. Although maybe it was another character. I can't remember. It might have been another character. Maybe one of our listeners can help us out. What movie would that have been in? I'm not sure. Well, his sister Jeannie was in school and she was stuck there all day. But maybe, uh, oh, maybe, oh, oh, could it have been Risky Business? Maybe. I haven't seen that a long time ago. Someone Although waiting all, for... All issues in Risky Business are overshadowed by um, that one, the one scene. You know, either Tom Cruise dancing on the in his underwear or... Um, right. You know, Rebecca De Mornay seducing him at his house. What about Fast Times? Uh, I don't think it was Fast Times. I'm, I'm going to go with Ferris Bueller's Day Off or Risky Business. But listeners, help us out. What movie did that happen? And what movie did the minute hand go backwards? Although That's all what... scenes in Fast Times were overshadowed by Phoebe Cates taking off her bikini top, which was for sure one of the all time classic 80s <laughs> movie yes. moments. Yes. And, and, for men. And yes. Yeah. I, I think I don't think we should talk about it anymore. All right, we're going off into the weeds here. All right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, before we wrap up, I'd like to give a special thanks to all of our lovely patrons. As you know, we don't run ads or have sponsors, so we really, really do appreciate the support we get from our patrons. If you want to learn more, just head to bangkokpodcast.com forward slash support. And if you want to get in touch with us, it's easy. Bangkok Podcast on social media, bangkokpodcast.com on the web, or simply bangkokpodcast at gmail.com. We are very polite, and if you write, we will answer. Yeah, baby. You can also find each episode on YouTube and follow us online where we post each episode and carry on conversations with our listeners. Actually, just today, Ed, I'm not sure if you saw, but I posted a, a quick message to all of our line followers that was a link to a YouTube video of the James Bond film, the 1974 James Bond film, The Man with a Golden Gun, which was a scene of a car chase in Bangkok in 1974, which was pretty interesting. Cool. I, you know, I didn't see the post, but I haven't seen that movie and I know the scene you're talking about. Yeah. You can also reach out to me directly on Twitter where I am BKK Greg. So thanks for listening, everyone. And we'll see you back here next week. Yep. See you next week. Talk to my friend Scott at work, who's British, and every once in a while, one of us will come out with a "I ate pikeys." <laughs> like a oh, really? Quote from Sla- a Snatch, just randomly. That's great. That's a good movie. Um, it's a good one, yeah. The the Brad Pitt character is uh, priceless. He sounds he's just a- like an Eastern Canadian. Oh, does he really? Yeah. Does he? He's, I, I remember uh, when I was in film school, I went out there and I did a documentary on some communities or something and we literally had to put subtitles on a few people that were talking because we just couldn't understand what the hell they were talking about. Well, that's how I am with like Welsh and some Scottish people. I, I don't know what the hell they're saying. <laughs> you know, like a, like a thick Irish brogue, like all that stuff. Right, yeah. It's pretty What are you going to do wrong. with the money? What are you going to do with the money? I need a caravan for me, ma. <laughs> yeah, exactly right. You're like, what? <laughs> but it, it's good in the movie, like they can't understand him either. They're like, what the, what the hell are you saying? <laughs> <laughs> uh, that was a good one.